Hello, welcome to the introduction to proofs video for axioms and theorems. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to distinguish between an axiom and a proposition or a theorem, and you should be able to make conjectures in axiomatic systems and prove them. We're going to start with a motivating problem. So this is not a math example, but it captures a lot of the um, ideas in a way that's a little bit simpler than what we'll see in math. So this is a chess problem, but it doesn't require like chess knowledge at all besides how do the some of the pieces move. In particular, how does the knight move? So this is a chess board and there's a knight in the bottom left. So here's the knight, it's the horse. And there's a king in the top right, so there's the king. In this problem, the king won't move. It will just stay there. And the knight can make any number of L moves at once. So an L move is two to the right and one up, or it's two up and one to the right. And in our particular setting, it always has to move up and to the right, at least one unit. So we're not going to allow the knight to move backwards at all. It always has to be moving towards the king. Our questions are, what are the possible squares the knight can reach? And in particular, can the knight reach the king's square just by using those types of moves? So in this problem, the axioms or the rules are these three. The, the first rule is that the, the knight starts at the bottom left. The second uh, rule is that the knight can move using the two right one up move. And the third rule is that the knight can move using the two up one right rule. Those are the three things that we're allowed to do in our problem. Now, our goal is to see what can we deduce from these axioms. So from these starting rules, what other positions are possible? What else can we conclude? And also, what other positions are impossible? So take a moment right now to play around with this problem. Um, make a, a chessboard if you want, or find one online, and play around, see what spaces you can reach using only these three rules. Make a conjecture as to whether or not you can get the king. Now, once you've played around with it for a while, um, you might discover the following uh, result. So if the knight can reach the uh, certain position, let's call it AB, then the knight can also reach the position A plus three, B plus three. So if you're at a particular place, then you can also reach the place that's three up, three up from it. So from the position, so let's see the proof of this. So if you're at position AB, then you can use the second move to go two right, one up. And then you can also use move three to go uh, one to the right and two up. So use, combining these two moves is the same as going three over and three up. Um, I guess we should be a little bit careful and say that uh, this position, a plus three, b plus three, has to be within the chessboard. But we're kind of imagining that uh, we're going to be doing a much like we're going to have a much larger chessboard and see what we can reach. But if we wanted to be very, very careful, we could say uh, the knight can reach this position, brackets, so long as it's within the chessboard. So this type of proposition is a thing that's now true about the, the movement of this piece. So it's not one of the axioms. It's not one of the rules that if the knight is out of position, then it can move three over and three up. But this is a type of move that's now allowed. We've proved it. Let's see what types of things we can show are impossible. So assuming that the bottom left square is one one, then the knight can't reach any of the positions one n or n one for any positive natu or, sorry, natural number greater than one. So the picture is something like this. The knight can't reach any of these squares, and it can't reach any of these squares. 
what does a proof of impossibility look like? Well, we have to say that no matter what rules we use, we can never get to these positions. Well, there's only two ways that the knight can move, and in both of the movements, it will have to increase both its x-coordinate and its y-coordinate. So if you're increasing, if you're trying to go this way, you also have to move up a little bit. So there's no actual way to reach these positions, you'll have to go up a bit. So uh, that's a proof of impossibility. The other ones get a little more complicated, but it's this type of analysis. You say, what are the moves that are allowed, and what sort of positions do those lead me to? Let's move away from uh, this motivating example, and let's get to some more mathy examples. So in math, we will often start with axioms about particular math objects, and we will want to deduce what else is true about these objects. So we're going to have lists of uh, rules or lists of things that are definitely true, and we're going to see what else can we conclude about them. We'll see an example about this in a moment, but let me just say that the list of axioms we use, um, depending on, the, on the, the context, they tend to be quite short, they're made as short as possible. They try not to include redundant rules. So each rule is uh, useful and unique. Um, you don't include any extra information. And in some sense, axioms should be scare quotes obvious, uh, and they should be scare quotes true. Uh, I won't say too much about this, uh, but when you see axioms later on in math, in, in other math courses, um, we'll often use it as a synonym for things that are obviously true. Um, part of this is uh, that when we're trying to deduce things about math and about math objects, it's, it's true that we can sometimes get confused about what sort of things are allowed, what moves are allowed. So you can imagine a game of chess where the players didn't agree on what sorts of moves knights should have. One of them might say, well, I think knights are strong and bold, and that means that they should be able to move um, uh, in a in a L shape that's two across and three up. And one of them says, well, I think knights are are strong, but I don't think they're that brave. And, and they could have disagreements about what sort of moves knights could make. You could see that this would lead to a, a difficulty in trying to answer this knight-king problem. This was also true in math. Um, we had difficulties deciding what things were true because we couldn't agree on what moves were allowed in mathematics. So one way to resolve this is to come up with a list of rules that we all agree on that are allowed to be used in math. So let's look at one of these sets of rules called the piano axioms of, of arithmetic. So here are the 10 rules for adding and multiplying integers together. Um, you can go through them all if you want. I'm not gonna list them all out, but you can pause the video and take a look at them. These rules are saying that adding integers are integers. You can change the order in which you add integers. Um, adding zero doesn't change anything. Multiplying by one doesn't change anything. Things like this. Now, the surprising thing is that there are only 10 rules here, and, then the, and that these 10 rules tend to capture a lot about um, arithmetic. Now, there are some rules that aren't on here, and let's look at some of those. So what are some rules about arithmetic for integers that you can think of that aren't on this list? So what are we missing? Well, here's an example of a, of a proposition or a fact that we're missing. We're missing the fact that minus zero is equal to zero. That's a true thing, that's something that we know. But why is it true? Now, in an axiomatic system, we start with the axioms, the 10 rules that we're allowed to use, and we combine them in ways to get this result. So let's combine the axioms to get this uh, result. So a proof of this fact is as follows. Um, the proof is going to be read in a sort of L shape. We're going to say this is equal to this, 
this is equal to the next line and this is equal to the next line. Therefore, this is equal to this. So why is zero equal to zero plus minus zero? This is axiom 10. It says that every number has an additive inverse. So zero has a minus zero. Now by axiom three, you can replace the order of these two things. And now we're adding zero to something. So it should just be the something. There we go. We've proved that zero is equal to minus zero. This is what a proof in an axiomatic system looks like. Every single step is justified explicitly by one of the axioms. And we all agree on the rules. We all agree on the axioms themselves. Now, um, in this course, we won't always explicitly justify everything by axioms. That would get quite tedious. But you should be prepared to do this, um, or at least on your own, um, be able to justify it. Every step you make, you should say, why am I doing this? Why am I allowed to do this? And you should have a reason why you're allowed to do it. What else are we missing? So here's another proposition we're missing. Zero times anything is zero. So you should try to prove that. Prove it using the, um, the, the axioms. And if you need to, you can use this proposition. Let's look at some notation uh, that will show up often in the course. So axioms are the starting assumptions in a rule set. So it's the things that we start from. A conjecture is something that you guess might be true. Might not have a proof yet, but you think this might be true. A proposition or a fact or a theorem are all different ways of saying true statements um, that follow from the axioms. These are things that have been proved. So they're true. You might also see the word lemma. A uh, lemma is used if it's a minor proposition or a, a very, very minor theorem. Um, you aren't, won't get in trouble for misusing these things or not using them exactly properly. But just know that sometimes uh, we might say lemma when we mean a very, very small theorem that's maybe only useful um, once. Theorems tend to be big and glorious and grand. Um, and be applicable in, in many different scenarios. One last thing you might see is a corollary. So a corollary is a special type of proposition that follows from a previously known theorem. So you might have proved some theorem about uh, all even integers, and then your corollary might be specifically about multiples of four. So it's a special case. We'll use these uh, pieces of language throughout the course. Now let's take a moment to reflect. You should go back and answer the king knight problem. So the question was, can the knight reach the king space? How would the knight king question change if you changed the axioms? So if you changed the rules of the game. For example, what would happen if you allowed all L-shaped moves, even ones that go backwards? Finally, do the piano axioms capture everything that's true about the integers? Is there anything missing? Thank you very much and have a good day.